By 1984, the center of the college basketball world was a small Jesuit school located just two miles from the White House. Throughout its almost 200-year history, Georgetown University had been known for its high academic standards and its lousy basketball team. But part of that perception began to change in 1972, when an imposing former NBA backup center with little experience was hired as head coach. Here was John Thompson, this black man. He wasn't just any black man. He was a guy, 6'10", 300 pounds. When you looked at him, he put the fear of God in you. John Thompson off what Thompson bought to Georgetown was really what he learned backing up Bill Russell for the Celtics, and he built the team around defense. When I first came to Georgetown University, I pointed to the wall and told him a national championship flag will fly in this building. Eloquent. He played the position. He's black. I, I think all of that, as a young black man growing up, it gave me something to aspire to be. After considering all the, the fact, my decision is to attend Georgetown University. Yeah! Yeah! Ewing made a resounding impact on the college basketball landscape. Oh, what a play! Ewing on the alley -oop. What a play! Carrying Georgetown to its first NCAA championship game in his freshman year. Ewing again! Ewing again! Ewing again! Only to be beaten in the waning seconds on a jump shot by another hot shot freshman from North Carolina. Some guy named George. <laughs> and Ewing, showtime! Despite the loss, Ewing had put the college basketball world on notice. For the next three years, a dominant force would patrol the paint in the nation's capital. But I see, see, the frustrating thing is with, with all that's going on in society today, why are we closing the door on kids who have motivation to try to do something constructive? You know, with all the fears that we have, I mean, at least let's be creative enough as educators rather than to say we're going to ostracize these kids from society, of saying let's be creative enough to use these energies on kids who at least have some form of motivation. We're not saying drop the standards. People who want to demean what we are doing will always say that they are opposed to standards. We're not opposed to standards, have never been opposed to standards. National champion. On April 2nd, 1984, Ewing's junior season concluded with Georgetown's first NCAA basketball championship. It had been 30 years since a Northeastern team last held the title, but John Thompson had made even more significant history. John Thompson is the first black coach to ever win the NCAA basketball championship. I'm not interested in being the first or only black doing anything because it implies that in 1984, a black man finally became intelligent enough to win the NCAA title, and that's a very misleading thing. I knew exactly the significance of me winning that game. Oh, you're paranoid on it. You know, a young boy said to me in the press conference, did it mean anything to me to be the first African-American? And I told him, if that means that I'm the first African-American that had the intelligence enough to do it, I find it very offensive. Because there have been a lot of guys that come before me that never was provided with an opportunity to do this. John Thompson and intimidation go hand in hand. That's the mainstream perception of John in his coaching career. They really thought John was concerned about a foul, but Thompson was concerned about the roughhouse tactics. And he let Patino have a blast over there in front of the scorer's table. Now they later shook and... 99% of America isn't right about most of the things. I set the standard for what will be done with my team. It's just that simple. I always felt that that was a problem to some whites. It's really evident how Georgetown was painted. You know, John Thompson just went into the darkest ghetto. <laughs> Got the meanest looking, roughest black thugs he can get. Put some Nikes on him and put him on the court. It wasn't just old guys from down south. Young black males from all over the country embraced the Hoyas and their us against the world attitude. It fused perfectly with a burgeoning cultural movement that featured in your face rap music symbolic fashion, and swagger. It would come to be known as hip-hop. Broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the stage, you know they just don't care. Underneath Morning in America, there was all this turmoil and all this energy and all this rage. 
junkies in the alley with the baseball. That sense of we're under siege, but we're gonna stand up to all of this stuff. And that was Georgetown. Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. Their timing was perfect. Georgetown became hip hop's first team. Matter of fact, I had a rap group that uh, I was forming, and I called them the Georgetown Gangsters. I went to St. Thomas, and I had a Georgetown t-shirt, like, what? Georgetown was your team, even though they were the bad guys. Georgetown was the jacket to get around 82, 83. I had my starter Georgetown jacket. I know I had my Georgetown jacket. It meant that you was down like Georgetown. It also meant that um, you had attitude. It also meant that you was bad. It also meant that you was dope. It also meant that you was fresh. It also meant that you was down by the law. I think that what we've got to understand is that we live in a different era now with young people. And these kids are exposed to a lot of things. They're more challenging. But those of us who are involved in the business of coaching, those of us who are involved in the business of teaching, that's a challenge. You, you don't expect the world to stay the same. And if the world changes, the people who are in the world change. So you don't see that as a fearful thing or something that you look at and that you're afraid of. A lot of people come to me and say, well, are you leaving college coaching because the young people are changing? Well, first of all, in all my years at Georgetown, Alan Iverson is the only young person that left who I did not want to leave because he was not prepared educationally or he was not prepared emotionally to deal with the NBA. Certainly I knew he was going to be an outstanding star and I thought he was a very intelligent person who would make the adapt adaptations if he doesn't get in trouble. Coach Thompson? Uh -huh. Coach. Coach Thompson? Saving my life? Uh -huh. For giving me uh, the opportunity, um, I was recruited by every school in the country for football and basketball. And uh, the incident happened in high school and all that was taken away. No other teams, no other schools were recruiting me anymore. My mom went to Georgetown and begged him. To give me a chance. And he did. And it's about the other thing that I find just a myth in America is an educated athlete. I don't believe anybody in America who's in business wants athletes to be educated if they intend on doing business with that athlete. And the minute that athlete becomes educated, they're somewhat offended by it. Because now, an educated athlete doesn't just say, yes, I boss, and sit there. He starts to question the system. <laughs> yeah, and right. so now, when you get guys like Patrick and Alonzo and Dikembe, and I was very proud because every time they got out of the car, the Georgetown guys were jumping up. But well, we had been arguing and fussing all the time about everything. I didn't always agree with every position that they took, even as it related to the lockout. But I was proud of the fact that now they're using their intelligence. Well, we talk a lot about athletes being educated. But the educated athlete, you're going to have problems. You're going to have lockouts. You're going to have boycotts. And people don't want that to happen.